from the speed, the first thing that comes to their mind is that the networks become speedier. I would say whenever somebody asks you what's the benefit of MTLS as a technology, speed is not the benefit. Speed was a foreseen or speed was a perceived benefit of MTLS when it was being developed. But because of tremendous gains on hardware side, speed is no more an issue. Even pure IP routers or pure IP devices have got interfaces which have speeds up to 40 gigabits per second. And there is no MPLS involved. So speed is no more an issue as such and MPLS does not give you any speed benefit in your networks. What MPLS gives you is two benefits. Very distinct, very clear two benefits. Number one, flexibility. And number two, optimization. So if anybody asks you what are the two benefits of MPLS or summarize what MPLS gives you, it's flexibility and optimization. You can use your network in a more flexible manner and you can optimize the performance of your network to suit your business needs. Because my friends, technology for the sake of technology doesn't serve any purpose. Unless a technology has a commercial and a business benefit, that technology is not going to get anywhere beyond the labs or the academia or the research centers. And a technology which has taken over the entire world must be offering some business benefits as well. So you need to understand not only the technology part of MPLS but also the business part of MPLS or the business benefits of MPLS, what is so special that MPLS offers. But first of all, let's take a brief look at what were the typical drawbacks of IP which force the service providers all over the world to adopt MPLS. How many of you are comfortable with IP networking or IP routing? Most of you, I suppose. Okay, who is not comfortable with IP routing? Anyone? No one. Don't be ashamed. If anybody is, please raise your hands. No one is. Good. Good thing is that at least we can maintain a certain pace in the lecture. You all understand how is routing done? You all have read routing, you studied routing, you experienced routing. How is routing done? What is the fundamental concept behind routing? How is routing made possible? By using, quality By using? Quality tables. forwarding tables. And what do you have in those forwarding tables? Well, we have a different information about routers. We have different information about? Well, the forwarding table as such does not contain information about the nodes, it only contains information about routes or the networks. To be specific, yes, we do have we do have tables which hold information about nodes, about interfaces and a lot of other stuff. But frankly speaking, forwarding table or a typical routing table only holds, holds information about the networks. So, whenever you have to reach a network, forwarding or routing, traditional IP forwarding or traditional IP routing is done on the basis of network portion of your destination IP address, if IP is your protocol, which we suppose is. So, forwarding will always be done on the destination, on the network portion of the destination IP address. It's very simple. Every router or every forwarding device that you have in your network will look at the destination IP address of the packet which it receives, consults its forwarding table, checks the network portion and forwards the packet appropriately to the next stop. This is how IP used to work. Based on this, a major flaw which we encountered was when for example, IP would be running over a layer 2 technology, let's say frame relay or ATM. Frame relay and ATM traditionally have been used as layer 2 technology. How many of you are comfortable with frame relay, by the way? Do you have any idea about frame relay? If you understand frame relay, in frame relay, traffic is forwarded not based on IP addresses. IP is a layer 3 technology. Frame relay doesn't understand anything about IP or IP addresses for that matter. Frame relay forwards traffic based on certain frame relay identification which we call DLCIs, data link connection identifiers. So when frame relay tries to forward packets based on DLCIs and IP tries to forward traffic or packets based on their IP addresses, there is a conflict. There is a sort of, I would say, a misunderstanding between the two. What exactly is the misunderstanding? Let's see, let me demonstrate.
See now, here we have an ATM or a frameless cloud. These three devices, let's suppose, are ATM or frameless switches, which are the service provider cloud. And the traffic enters from this forwarding or routing device, layer 3 device, into this network. And as you understand, in frame relay, we have got virtual circuits. Virtual circuits make the connectivity possible. What happens in frame relay is that if you want to send traffic from this device or from this network to this network, logic dictates and common sense says that the traffic should enter here, go here, and exit from here. But the problem is that the underlying technology is a layer 2 technology. It does not understand. These devices do not understand that 10.1.1 IP address is sitting here. It is not intelligent enough to understand where do different IP addresses live because it does not have a layer 3 forwarding table with it. So what it does is we have sort of a static configuration in this network where we say that any traffic that enters from here on this router should be sent so this router and this router will make the following decision. So the traffic will come following this red line, will come here. Then it will re-enter the network and then exit from here and reach its destination. This is how IP over frame relay works or IP over ATM works. And we can clearly see that the traffic or the, or the packets are traversing this link twice for no reason at all. And we can clearly see that we have a sub-optimal forwarding taking place here. This is not optimal forwarding. What we call it is sub-optimal routing or sub-optimal forwarding. Because of this sub-optimal forwarding, just look at the cost which the service provider will have to bear. Extra hardware strength of this switch because now it is handling traffic which it is not supposed to handle. Extra bandwidth required on this particular link because it is handling extra traffic which it should not be handling and this directly impacts the cost of the service provider and it directly impacts the cost which the service provider is charging to the customers. So it's a no-win situation for either the service provider or the customers. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we could somehow, somehow manage to move this traffic directly from this side to this one? And this is where MPLS comes in. If you replace this network core, which was an ATM network core, with an MPLS network core, you'll get the optimization you require, and you'll get the flexibility to do a lot more, which you could never think of with IP. So it not only will give us the solution, but it will also give us a lot of other options like traffic engineering and VPNs, virtual private networking as well, or layer 2 VPNs as well. So this is one of the fundamental problems because of which when the technology was introduced, the service providers jumped onto the technology and adopted it like hotcakes. And by the way, if we, if we move away from technology a bit, hardcore technology, you, you have to understand that whenever a technology emerges, whenever there is a new technology, service providers are the first ones to adopt the technology because of two very obvious reasons. Firstly, because the service providers have got the skill level to manage their technology. It's a new technology. It requires a very high level of skills. So the service providers have got the appropriate skill level available with them in the, in the form of human resource. So they adopt the technology early because they can manage the technology. Secondly, they want to have the competitive advantage of being the first adopters of technology and thus drive the maximum profits out of it. Because once the technology has become common, you cannot actually draw any profits out of it. Then it's, it becomes a utility. But once the technology is new, you can draw or make a lot of money out of it. So service providers who actually are making money based on technology. Banks don't make money because of technology. Technology is an enabler. Banks make money because of their financial models. A production of Manufacturing concern, a manufacturing unit, a factory does not make money because of their technology. They make money because of their machines and the products they are producing. But service providers make money because of technology, because of telecommunications and IT technologies. So they are the first ones to adopt the technology. 
when the technology gets maturer, when it gets a little cheaper, it comes to the enterprises, large corporations, large companies. When it becomes still cheaper and the expertise becomes still more available, it goes to the lower end of the market and finally it enters your home. Home user is the last adopter of technology. Service providers are the first adopters of technology, any technology, telecommunication technology, and home users are the last ones. So looking at this, MPLS was initially adopted by service providers because of these two reasons. They could handle the technology and they could derive business benefits out of the technology. And now the technology has matured, even the enterprises are adopting this technology and these are the benefits which they are enjoying. Their network performances have improved, their IT budgets have been cut down and their total cost of ownership, that has decreased tremendously. So this is a technology which is not a technology alone but it makes a lot of business sense for everybody who is adopting it. So when you leave your universities, when you leave your colleges, when you graduate, you hit the world and you realize that technology for the sake of technology was only in academia. If a technology is not making commercial sense, nobody is going to adopt the technology. So once again, MPLS is a technology which covers both the ends. Technology provides it superior and commercially it gives a lot of benefits. Let's take another example, another scenario where IP would not serve the purpose. You see, this is how traffic would move if it was a pure IP network or IP over ATM network. And then it would reach the destination. Similarly, let's look at another situation. Let's look at another scenario. We've got a service provider which has got its network running. It has got three sites, a large site A, a large site B, and a relatively smaller site C, which is at the bottom. When site A and site B are communicating, they've got a link between them, direct link between them of OC192. Can anyone guess or does anyone know what's the bandwidth of OC192? Anyone? Have you studied SONET or STH? Well, it would suffice even if I said it's a lot of bandwidth. But it's around 2 gigabits of bandwidth. And the link at the bottom, this is got OC48 link, which is around 622 megabits. So this is also high bandwidth link, but not as high as the top link, which is OC192. If you run any routing protocol or any forwarding protocol in this network, all the traffic from site A to site B or from site B to site A would traverse this link, would cross this link. None of the traffic would be following the lower two links because the metric or the cost or, or the cost of using the upper link is much less as compared to the lower links. So all the traffic would be crossing the top link. And in this situation, we can come to a scenario where we can reach a position where the top link is choked because all the traffic is trying to cross this link, this link is choked, and this link or these links are actually sitting empty. They are not even being utilized. Whereas you are paying such a heavy cost of maintaining these links. The service provider is paying such a heavy price for maintaining these links, but these links are not even being used. And your traditional IP forwarding does not offer a scalable solution where you could use both the links. You could use this path as well as this path for forwarding the traffic. Once again, because IP does not offer any solution, if you run MPLS in this network, and if you run an application of MPLS which we call MPLS Traffic Engineering, by using MPLS Traffic Engineering, you can very conveniently use both the links and use them the way you want. You want to send equal traffic on both the links, 